Right, well, in the first half, we looked at how uh, Mark's gospel is a developing story from beginning to end, and all the way through story, really significant new developments are happening. It's an unfolding story. Uh, can I just say again, uh, if you want to get into Mark a bit more, you will find that Dig Deeper book really helpful to join the story up so that it becomes a story rather than just a bunch of events in the life of Jesus. I think you'll find that very helpful. What I want uh, to do in the second half is uh, to deal with the issue that I raised earlier on, to look at how the Old Testament story drives the book of Mark along, and especially how Isaiah drives the book of Mark along. And uh, what I'm going to try and do is to look at three short passages in Mark uh, one right at the beginning, one kind of in the middle, one sort of near the end, uh, all of which have very significant Old Testament background that really makes a difference to how you read the bits uh, in Mark. So I'd like you please to turn to chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 1. We may not get through all of this, so we'll see how we're going time-wise, but I'll try and get through all uh, at least uh, if some, uh, some of it may only be briefly. Let me read the first three vo verses. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, <clears throat> make his paths straight. So, Mark says, Isaiah announces a messenger who will come announcing the arrival of the Lord. And notice how Mark goes on. Verse 4, John appeared. Who's John? He's the messenger. John the Baptist. He's the messenger. And he's come to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, that quotation in verses 2 and 3 is not, in fact, only from one passage. There are three passages in the Old Testament which contribute to this. It's a kind of composite quotation, and we're going to look at two of them which are particularly important. One of them is Isaiah chapter 40, and one of them is in Malachi chapter 3. So, if you'd like to keep a finger in Mark chapter 1, I'd like to turn you back to Isaiah chapter 40. Now, let me just set the scene for this. Um, where are we in the Old Testament story? Well, Isaiah is one of the uh, writing prophets, and we're a long way on in the Old Testament story by Isaiah 40. The people of Israel, rescued from slavery in Egypt, taken to the promised land to live under God's loving rule. They prove themselves to be resolutely unfaithful. And as a result of that, after a long, long, long time and much mourning, God sends the prophets. The prophets say various things. Not least, if you carry on behaving unfaithfully, you will be thrown out of the land that I took you to. And so the prophets look forward to the exile of, of the people of Israel from the land of Canaan. And in particular, in these chapters, uh, to the exile of the southern kingdom, Judah, with Jerusalem the capital, to the Babylonians. And we all know about Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who we meet in the book of Daniel and so on. He's the guy who moved in from Babylon and, uh, and took over the southern kingdom. So where are we in the story by Isaiah 40? Well, Isaiah has prophesied that the exile is coming, but here he prophesies an end to the exile. Something good is going to happen. The exile to Babylon is not going to be the end of the story. Um, I'm going to read three verses, the first three verses, and then I'd like you to do a little work. The three questions I want you to ask are, who is coming? First, and the, I'll find the answer in verse three. And where is he coming to? And you'll find the answer in verses 9 and 10. And what's he going to do when he comes? Um, 
And you'll find the answers to that also in verses 9 and 10 and all the way through this bit. So let me read the first three verses and then I'll get you to do a little bit of work. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, her iniquity pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The great troubles of the exile are going to come to an end. Verse 3, and here's the bit that Mark quotes. A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So, with your neighbour for a few minutes, who's coming? Where's he coming to? Verses 9 and 10. And what's he going to do? Talk about that, please. <clears throat> Okay, folks, how did you get on? A messenger is calling. Somebody is coming. Who is coming? Easy answer. God is coming. Absolutely. God is coming. Where is he coming to? Jerusalem. Absolutely right. And what's he going to do? He's going to... Yes, he is. He's going to lead his people like a shepherd leading his sheep. Did you see that in chapters nine, uh, 10 and 11? Uh, the picture is of a shepherd leading his sheep across the wilderness to Jerusalem. What's that a picture of? It's a picture of God rescuing his people from Babylon, leading them back to, the, to Jerusalem from exile. So here we have a messenger announcing God coming to Jerusalem with, to, do, to do the big rescuing thing and bringing his people back. Right, now I'd like you to flip on to Malachi chapter 3 because this is the other uh, significant Old Testament quote, uh, bit of Mark chapter 1. So just flip right over to Malachi, right over to the end of the Old Testament story. Where are we in the story? Well, we are... After the return of people from exile in Babylon to Jerusalem, they've come back. They've rebuilt the temple. In some ways, things are going quite well. In other ways, not so well. Chapter 3, verse 1. Recognize this. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Do you see, very like Isaiah 40 and very like Mark chapter 1. Let me read uh, the next couple of verses and then I'll get you to do a bit of work on this uh, little section and you might want to pay attention to chapter 4 verse 5 as well. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? 
And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He'll sit as a refiner and purify of silver and purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Same question. Who's coming? Where to? How's it going to go, this visit? And uh, chapter 4, verse 5, how else is the messenger described? Talk about those for a minute. Got a couple of minutes to talk about that. <clears throat> Okay, folks, easy questions. Who's coming? The Lord, same as before. Where to? To his temple. So not just to the city of Jerusalem, but to the temple. How's it going to go? Yes, it's going to be an uncomfortable visit. Notice it will have a good result in the end. There will be proper offerings offered there. But that big question, who will endure the day of his coming? It's not going to be a comfortable visit. Flipping on to chapter 4, who's the, le the, the, the messenger identified as, as in chapter 4? Elijah. He's an Elijah figure. Now, fast forward to Mark chapter 1, please. <clears throat> Who's the messenger? Verse 4. Easy question. John the Baptist. Why do we get all that stuff about his dietary and dress sense? Chapter verse 6. Why do you think? Anyone know? I mean, why is that interesting? What he wore and what he ate. Well, if you look at 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, just scribble a note. We haven't got time to look at it now. He's wearing Elijah clothes because those are the clothes that Elijah wears in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8. He's the Elijah figure of Malachi 4. Now, notice Mark doesn't tell you that, but he does tell you what he wears. And anybody who's been at their Old Testament Sunday school for many years knows that those are Elijah clothes he's wearing. He's the Elijah figure promised in Malachi chapter 4. So here we get two Old Testament passages, a messenger announcing the coming of the Lord. One, very hopeful and optimistic, joy, rescue. The other, not so comfortable. Both of them describe a journey to Jerusalem, one to the city, one to the temple. I wonder if you remember that I said in the first session that Mark's gospel is a straight line gospel from Galilee to Jerusalem. What happens in Jerusalem? Obvious. What's the big thing that happens in Jerusalem? Jesus' death, yes, which is a big rescue thing. Uh, kind of along with uh, um, um, Isaiah chapter 40. It's a big, joyful rescue type thing. However, however, something else happens in Jerusalem. Turn to chapter 11. Jesus enters Jerusalem. The crowd recognize him to be the king. 
What does he do when he gets to Jerusalem? Verse 11. First thing he does, he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, this is one of those cliffhanger moments in Mark's gospel. Nothing happens that day. What are you expecting? He's going to go back and give them a rough time. How is that introduced in Mark's gospel? Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, quoted right at the beginning of the gospel. Do you see how those two quotations drive the shape of the whole book? Isaiah promises a journey to Jerusalem, a great rescuing journey. Malachi promises a journey to Jerusalem, a visit to Jerusalem, a very uncomfortable visit to the temple. What do we get here? A very uncomfortable visit to the temple. The temple is the, the main scene for, for chapters 11 to 16. And it goes on and on and on. And it's very uncomfortable in the temple. Um, now, uh, we'll come on to that. We'll look at, again at that just a little bit later because we're going to look at chapter 11 and work out what's wrong with the temple exactly. But notice, folks, we're used to saying Jesus goes to Jerusalem to die for the salvation of the world, and he does. But he also comes to Jerusalem to look around and judge the temple in Jerusalem. It's a big thing in Mark's gospel, as we'll see when we get to chapter 11. And it's set up right from the beginning of the gospel onwards, from that Malachi quotation. Do you see? That quotation shapes the whole of the story from that point onwards. Now, uh, let me go on. Uh, I'll give you another example, and then we'll come back to the temple in chapter 11, because I want to look at that one in a bit more detail. Chapter 6, verse 52, just one verse. <clears throat> And I want you to talk to your neighbour about what the surprise is. Um, Jesus walking on the water. And um, I'll pick up the story at verse 48. He saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. And they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Question, what's the surprise about verse 52? Talk to your neighbor about that for a moment. There's a big, big surprise there, verse 52. What's the surprise? Okay, folks, any offers? Any suggestions? What's surprising about verse 52? Yes. Notice, did you notice that? They are, very, they are very afraid and surprised. The way it's written implies that if they'd understood about the loaves, they would not have been so frightened on this occasion. The big question, what on earth has this got to do with the loaves? Isn't that surprising? Funny thing to say. What's he referring to, do you think, when he says they did not understand about the loaves? Which loaves do you think? Just look back quickly. The loaves and fishes, indeed, which comes just beforehand. So it was a massive thing. Okay, that might be the link. If you, there's a big miracle. If you'd understood that one, 
this big miracle wouldn't be so surprising. So that might be the link, but you've got to ask the question, what is the link between those two things? In some way, they appear to be linked. Um, let, me, uh, let me give you a suggestion for that. Just look at uh, Mark chapter 30, 6, verse 30. Um, let me point out some details of the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 32. They went away in the boat to a desolate place, literally a wilderness place by themselves. Big crowd follows. Verse 34. He went to shore and he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Remember any sheep shepherd stuff this evening or any? It's what Isaiah promises, doesn't it? A rescuer like a shepherd leading his sheep. He began to teach them many things. Everybody gets hungry. Disciples say, please send them away. You give them something to eat, he says, verse 37. They say, no, come off it. We can't do that. <laughs> he commands them, verse 39, to sit down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people and divided the two fish among them all and they all ate and were satisfied. Here's the question. Does it remind you of anything, this event? Wilderness place, large number of people, miraculous bread. Ring any bells? Manna in the wilderness. It does ring bells with that, doesn't it? And there are lots of details here which are a bit like that. Wilderness place, wilderness place, wilderness place. Mark says several times, a lonely place, miraculous feeding. Um, now, I'd like to turn back to Isaiah 43. Here's the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 43. You could go to many places in Isaiah for this. But this one will do. Isaiah 43. And I'm going to read from verse... Fourteen, and then I want you to talk briefly about verses 16 and 17 and 18 to 21. What is the Lord reminding Isaiah of, or the people of, and what is he promising to do? Verse 14, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake, I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans and the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Okay, folks, here's the question. What event is the Lord reminding them of in verse 16 and 17? Anyone? What's he looking back to? The Exodus, good, and the defeat of Pharaoh's army in the sea. Remember who I am? I'm the God who did that back then, he says. What does he say after that? Verse 18, forget that one. I'm going to do a new thing. What's he going to do? He's going to make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, drink for his people in the desert. What does that remind you of? When does God lead his people through the desert and provide water miraculously for them? At the Exodus. Now, isn't this interesting, folks? He says, remember what I did back then? Well, forget that. I'm going to do something new, but it's going to be like that. <laughs> do you see that? I'm going to do a big new rescue, a bit like the old one, but bigger and better. Now, if you read through Isaiah 40 to 55, it is absolutely stuffed with that kind of language. I am going to do a big new Exodus type rescue. That's the rescue I'm going to bring. 
uh, looking forward. So think about the old one, but that's, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be much bigger than that one. <laughs> okay. Now, um, here's the question, folks. Here's the question. This is a difficult question. Why might... Mark 6, why might miraculous bread and a big water crossing miracle be related? Why, if you'd got one, would the other one be easier to get? Well, here's my suggestion. Because they're both somewhat reminiscent of the Exodus. If you'd realized that the big bread thing was a bit like manna in the wilderness, it wouldn't be such a surprise to see a big water crossing miracle suddenly, suddenly wandering along. So I think it's not just that one's powerful and the other one's powerful. I think it's one reminds you of the Exodus. And if you'd got that one, this one wouldn't be such a surprise. Why? Because God has promised a big new Exodus type rescue. Who is Jesus? He's the big new Exodus type rescuer. Now that is a very important theme in Mark's gospel. Jesus has come to bring a rescue that is like the Exodus of old, but bigger and better and really does. What, is, what was the problem with the Exodus? What did it not do for people? It took them from slavery in Egypt. It took them to a promised land. At its best, the promised land was great. What did the Exodus not do for people? Anyone? The only thing it didn't really do. Good, it didn't really deal with the sin problem. It did all the other things, but it didn't really deal with the sin problem. That's exactly right. Jesus has come to bring an Exodus-like rescue which really deals with the sin problem. That's how Mark portrays Jesus' rescue. So not surprisingly, when we get to the death of Jesus, what's the language that surrounds the death of Jesus to describe his death? It's like the... Back in the Exodus, Jesus' death is like the... Passover, yes, good. It's like the Passover, but bigger and better. Do you see that? Big Exodus rescue. Isaiah promises, yeah, it was good, but not good enough. There's going to be a bigger one. Jesus does all the Exodus type things uh, in Mark's gospel. And it's a very big theme uh, in Mark's gospel. Jesus is the big Exodus type rescuer. If you'd got manna in the wilderness you wouldn't be so surprised at somebody walking on water because <laughs> that's very reminiscent of Exodus type things. I think that's probably how that works. Right, still with it? Still live? One more? Good, excellent. Quickly, uh, over to Mark chapter 11. Um, <clears throat> Mark chapter 11. Um, here, Jesus comes to the temple. He looks around at everything. Uh, just worth looking out for that little phrase in Mark's Gospel. There are several times when Jesus looks around at everything, and all of those looks are pretty scary. <laughs> and this is certainly a scary look, don't you think? Now, what's wrong with the temple? Um, let's look at um, verse 17. Jesus comes to the temple, overturns the uh, money changers and the, the pigeon sellers. Verse 17, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? Um, that first bit, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, surprise, surprise, comes from Isaiah. <laughs> In Isaiah 56, Isaiah promises that God is going to make his temple so glorious that all the nations are going to pile in there and know God in the temple. What's Jesus' criticism at this point? That the owners of the temple, the rulers of the temple, have made it a den of robbers. Now, that's the bit we're going to look at. 
And I'd like you to turn back to Jeremiah 7, because that den of robbers phrase comes from Jeremiah chapter 7. So turn back, please, to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah preaches a stunning, devastating sermon in the temple. And this is a bit of the uh, sermon in the temple. And again, I'll get you to just work through this very quickly. I'm going to read verses 9 to 11. And I want you to talk about what are the people doing? Where are they doing it? In what way has the temple become a den of robbers? Okay, here we go. Verse 8. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you've not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? There's the phrase. Okay, talk to your partner. What are the people doing? Where are they doing it? How has the temple become a den of robbers? That's the question. Talk about that for a minute, see how you get on. Okay, folks, what are the people doing? All kinds of bad things, all kinds of bad things. Where are they doing all those bad things? Is that what he says in the temple? Every day, all over the place is the answer to that. So here's the question. How has the temple become a den of robbers? Let me ask it slightly differently. What do robbers do in their den? Yes, they hide. It's a secure place. Notice, folks, the robber's den is not the place the robbers do the robbing. The den is the place of security that they retreat to, having done their misdeeds outside. That is exactly what Jeremiah is saying. You do all that stuff out there and you retreat to the temple because you think because the temple is there and of the stuff you do in it, you are safe. Now, if Jesus is using that quotation like that in Mark chapter 11, where is the problem in Mark chapter 11? Where is the problem located? Everywhere. That's exactly right. The temple is a false sense of security for these people. Now, we tend to read this passage and say, the bad stuff that's going on here is the stuff that's going on inside the temple. But actually... That's the point, because there's sinners within the people who are in it. Oh, there is. Oh, there is indeed. And, and when we get to chapter 12, that's unpacked big time. There is. But notice, it's the whole of life that's the problem, not just the religious bit. And actually, that's been a major theme of Mark so far. Jesus constantly knocking heads with these people 
about how they're living the whole of life. The temple is their full sense of security in this book, just as it was back in Jeremiah's day. That, I think, is why he uses that quotation. Now, what is God going to do with his temple? Remember Mark 11 goes, we looked at this earlier on, it goes, temple, fig tree, temple, fig tree, temple. <laughs> it's the licorice all sort, okay? Look at verse 14 and verse 20. These are things that happen to the fig tree. Verse 14, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. Verse 20, the fig tree the next day, dead. What is God going to do with his temple? What do you think? Yeah. Sorry? Clear, yeah, more than clear it out. Destroy it. No fruit ever again. You see, that, that temp, the fig tree is a picture of the temple. When Jesus curses the fig tree and it withers, in the middle of that licorice all sort, it's surrounded by temple. He passes verdict on it. No fruit ever again. It's a very, very severe judgment. It's not just that he tidies the temple out. He pronounces judgment on it. Malachi's question, who can endure the day of his coming? Answer, well, the temple won't. That's quite scary, isn't it? But this uh, false sense of security right in the middle of the nation, the place they think that makes them secure because of what, they, what goes on there, it's over, he says. He looks around, and the next day he pronounces judgment on it. Very scary, that, isn't it? And a lot of the next chap chapters are tied up with that, with that issue. So it's not just that Jesus comes to Jerusalem to die. He comes to Jerusalem to pass judgment on that religious system. No fruit ever again from this. Now, um, here's the question. Remember Isaiah 56? My house will be a house of prayer for all the nations. What's the problem if you destroy the temple? No house of prayer for the nations. So how's that promise going to be fulfilled if he's just passed judgment on the temple? Well, let's roll the story on to chapter 15. We, let's go back where we uh, started, chapter 15. How is God going to make his temple a house of prayer for all the nations? Let's look again at verse 37. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. How is God going to make his temple a house of prayer for all the nations? Well, notice, we often read the tearing of the temple curtain as merely open access to God. What else does it signify? Redundancy. That thing's gone now. What happens the moment that sign of redundancy comes on the temple? Verse 39, a centurion, a Gentile, says he's the guy. Now, we don't know exactly what this man understood by this. We, it, there's no explanation of that. But isn't that striking? At the point where the temple curtain is torn, that system is no longer operative. At that point... There's a Gentile, the only one who says anything in this book, apart from the Syrophoenician woman a few chapters back, saying he's the guy. And notice, at this point, we, we, we meet the, the quotation from chapter 1, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Gentile is the, is the guy who recognizes something in the cross of Jesus that nobody else recognizes. Now, is that not striking? 
my house will be a house of prayer for all the nations. It's just not going to look like a temple anymore. <laughs> Who is the house, where is the house of prayer for all the nations? Yeah, more than that. Yeah, yeah the, risen, the, the died and risen and ascended Lord Jesus is the point of access for all the nations and the gospel that he sends out in the world. Now, it doesn't look, very, doesn't look very like a temple, that does it. But that's the fulfillment of that promise. Who will endure the day of his coming, says Malachi. Chapter 11, not the temple. However, Malachi 3 also says, but God, offerings will be brought to God. My house of prayer will be a house of prayer for all the nations. Jesus' death is the thing that, that fulfills all that temple promise. <laughs> Makes the whole thing happen. Folks, this is a very exciting book. <laughs> it's seriously joined up. It's a big unfolding story. We haven't really had, we've only had a chance to scrape the surface, but it's very carefully joined up. And do you notice how the Old Testament drives the story? The Old Testament picks, paints a picture of a great rescue, the Exodus, which does everything apart from deal with the sin problem. The Old Testament promises a new, bigger and better Exodus-type rescue. And here in Mark's Gospel, that is all unfolded. Jesus is the Exodus-type rescuer. Jesus is going to come and bring what the temple never could bring. In fact, he's going to judge and remove that old system and something entirely new has come. So, brothers and sisters, we do not have to do pilgrimages to Jerusalem to access God. Isn't that a joy? <laughs> It's terrific, isn't it? How do, you, how do you meet God now? Just think of it. You meet God now. My wife became a Christian, age of 12, in the school changing room, when her friend told her about the Lord Jesus. Isn't that an amazing thing? You hear words gospel words spoken by an ordinary person in the school changing room, across the garden fence, in the supermarket, at a coffee morning, and suddenly, boom, you're right into the presence of the living God through words spoken by an ordinary person. Isn't that an amazing thing? Once upon a time, to access God, you had to travel to that point. Isn't it an amazing thing that God has done? Mark explores all of how that unfolds. Um, now, of course, we don't get all the whole story because we don't get Pentecost in Mark's gospel. We don't get that far, but that's where, that's where the story goes in the end. But that, the temple is the middle of everything. That's gone forever. What is the middle of everything? Well, the risen Jesus is the middle of everything. And you access him at any point where you hear his words spoken by somebody else. It's an amazing thing that God has done. Um, folks, our time is gone. It's a very exciting book. Um, persevere with it. Uh, read it. Get that Dig Deeper book. It'll be really helpful in getting further in. Let me pray. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for the uh, wonderf wonderful story of the Bible as it unfolds. And we thank you for the wonderful way in which this gospel is put together. Thank you that Jesus came to bring the promised rescue. A rescue like the Exodus, but so much bigger and better. A rescue which would finally deal with the sin problem. We recognize that he came to judge the false religion of the people of Israel. We recognize our own human capacity to put our confidence in religious things as a way of avoiding you. We see in this book how the human sin problem is so big that we need a rescuer from outside. We thank you that you've provided this one and we pray that you'd help us uh, however long we've been in the Christian life. We pray that you'd help us to be eager to learn more about him, to understand him better, 
to rejoice at the amazing access that you've given us to God in your Son. So uh, hear our prayer, we pray. We pray for um, tomorrow and uh, the gatherings uh, tomorrow uh, morning and evening and Craig preaching. And we pray, Lord, that you'd be at work uh, in, in this place for good tomorrow. And indeed, that you would use this place uh, as a place where your word goes out and people are brought from death to life, from darkness to light, from far away into the presence of the living God through the gospel word. Please would you mercifully do that and use us in that work, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.